you're on Zoom, you need to be on mute, and your video needs to be off. So that the only thing that we're seeing on the camera is our room here. Our room here happens to be the Heston College Library. And we're here for reasons that I think will become abundantly clear here in a minute. Another ground rule is we want you to designate one person in your group, if, you're, if there's more than one of you in the room, to be the typer. So you talk together, you generate questions. Here in a minute, I'm gonna ask you to do some Martian questions. So you'll generate your Martian question or a comment, it can be either, and you're gonna type it to Isaac if you're Facebook Live, Jill if you're on Zoom, and then we're gonna read these remarks out loud. And then my face-to-face -face audience will be doing some other things with Bible commentaries and also talking. They're also getting to eat too, so like, mm. it's all good. Anyway, our theme for all four of these podcasts are love is a verb. Last week, we talked about Micah 6, 6 through 8, and I'd like to start by just saying that from memory. Let's see if I can do it. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? And actually, isn't that the $64,000 question? Three things, folks, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Now, we're gonna take that second phrase, to love kindness, and piece it apart in these four sections. We talked, we gave a personal story last week, we're gonna do a parable of Jesus's this week, and we're gonna go to the Old Testament next week. Yes, there's even that kind of loving kindness, in, or lack thereof, <laughs> in the Old Testament. So what does it mean to love kindness? Specifically, it means this to love it or to be really happy when people get better than what they deserve. Let me just say it another way. To really be happy for someone else when they get an abundance of radical grace. Shalom justice, which is the main form of justice in the Bible, the justice I think Jesus really lived out, is a very similar, has a very similar understanding. In essence, it means this, to give people what they need instead of what they deserve. And most of the time, we deserve something worse than what we get from Jesus. And that's Shalom Justice. But before we jump into our New Testament story for tonight, I think we need to do just a little bit of practice in going back into the biblical context. Every story, everything you all say or you all write has a context. Let me give an example here. At Heston College, we have the Bills and Normas. For my people in the room, how many of you know Bills and Normas? Some shout outs? Yeah. Yes, yes, all right. Okay, they can't see their hands, but yeah. <laughs> but maybe for many of you, you're like, uh, Bills and Normas. It, it's a story, it's a very specific meaning. So about 30, 35 years ago, four male college students happened to be in a used clothing store, found gas station attendant shirts that all said Bill, 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 Bill. They bought them, they showed up at a basketball game, they did some funny skits, and everybody's like, oh, that's great, you guys are the Bills. So, four very comical female students from Heston College said, we will not be outdone good for them. And they found shirts and became the Jills. And for some reason, no offense to my friend Jill, the, the Jill name didn't stick, but there's something about Norma that just, for all of you out there in internet land who are named Norma, love the name, but I, it just, they're just, Norma, it just worked. So to this very day, we have two comedy teams here at the college, the Bills and Normas, right? And you all have heard of them. Or maybe have seen them. Yeah. Yeah, that's the context. The same thing is true in the Bible. Sometimes what you think you understand, you really don't because you don't understand the history or the culture of the biblical times. And why is this so important? Because if you make a Bible story mean something to you, 
that it did not mean to the original audience, then you're misinterpreting the Bible story. You're making the Bible say whatever it is you want to say. And I personally think that's one of the biggest problems in Christianity today, is we make the Bible say whatever we want. We cannot do that. So we're going to practice what we call crossing the hermeneutical bridge. I drew it out here. If I were really good at this, I'd draw a time machine. But you know what? I'm not a good drawer, and bridges are easier. So what you do is we always start in the modern times. For us, it's 2017, right, guys? And we have to – got to put them on first. Use it, okay. We have to always take off our worldview glasses. Everybody's got them. Some of them not as pretty as mine. But – Here's what I mean by that. Our worldview is the way we see reality, what we think is really real. I see the world through the glasses. I hate to even say this, but let's get it over with. A middle-aged woman, ugh, white, born in Missouri. And see, that makes it different. If I were born in California, I probably would have a slightly different worldview or born in Bolivia or born in New Zealand. And all of the, and, and I've grown up in an Anabaptist Mennonite home, that also forms glasses. What I need to do is I need to take off these glasses to the very, very best of my ability, and so do you. Your worldview glasses are slightly different than mine, but we gotta take them off. Now, I'm gonna be honest, nobody can take off their glasses completely. I will never totally see the Bible completely in a neutral way. I'll always kind of see it as a white woman from Missouri. Who loves the Royals and they won by the way and anyway, all right I, I digress so we're gonna practice this I'm gonna put these back on we're gonna take the concept of words that's pretty easy words in 2017 so I'm gonna ask my online audience do we think highly of words in this society yeah, I've seen some have you ever heard of this phrase sticks and stones may break my bones but names will never hurt me yeah, yes. we've all heard that. That's baloney, by the way. They hurt terribly. I actually would rather you threw a stone at me than just talk behind my back. But Right? I mean, that's baloney. But that's what we say. We say, eh, words. If I say something bad, I say, oh, oh I didn't mean that. And it's okay. We're going to cross the Hermitical Bridge. Oop, here we go. The ancient biblical world absolutely did not feel that way about the concept of words. They called it Debar. God actually used Debar, which was so powerful that God created the entire universe by just speaking. That's the power of Debar. And if you don't understand Debar, then many stories, especially in the Old Testament, are just like so weird you can't, you're like, what? Let's take a very familiar story. Jacob, his twin brother Esau, Jacob steals the blessing from Esau by deceiving his blind father. Do you find it comforting that Bible families are a bit dysfunctional, just like yours? <laughs> anyway, so here we go. We and it's like, and then there's manipulative little mother Rebecca who puts fur on Jacob's arms. So he has hairy arms like Esau. He goes into his blind father, says he's Esau. Isaac's not sure, finally believes him and gives him the blessing, which is basically just saying some words. Now, if this would happen in 2017. And we suddenly realized that we'd blessed the wrong son. What would we do? Bless the other son. We'd bless the other son, says my online, my face-to-face -face audience. And absolutely, we'd say, whoops, you're grounded for two months. I'm blessing the other son. But Isaac doesn't. He weeps. Esau weeps for two reasons. Words are very important. And because it's Debar, the blessing cannot be revoked. Isaac cannot take it back. And you see, if you don't really understand it, that that story is kind of weird. Okay, we're going to do the very same thing with Luke 15, verses 11 through 13. Here's what we're going to do as we get into the story. Here in a couple minutes, we're going to have students reading just a part of the story. This is the story of the prodigal son. Or maybe, maybe the prodigal father, depending on your interpretation. And then... My people in the room here with me are going to use Bible commentaries and find out some information about this. And uh, 
you out there in internet land are going to come up with good Martian questions. Here's what that means. I want you to assume it's important to pretend to be a Martian because that's another way of taking off your worldview glasses. Like ask what as an American or as a Canadian would seem like a really stupid question to ask. What does family mean here? What does breakfast mean here? Do pigs have a special meaning? I mean, that kind of stuff. So you're a Martian who speaks English, and I want you to turn in Martian questions for me. Remember, you've got one designated typer who's going to do that as soon as you hear these Bible verses being read. And then we'll, we'll hear from our research, and we'll see how close, how good of question askers you really are. I'm going to ask Miguel to come up. He's going to read first. We're reading Luke 15, verses 11 through 13. Thank you, Miguel. Then Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he, div he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all, all he had and, travel and traveled to a distant country. There he squandered his property and dissolute living. Okay. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Miguel. Thank you, thank you. All right. Start formulating your Martian questions. Group here. Open that up to, you go to Luke chapter 15, and you'll start to see what specifically it says about verses 11 and 13. Mia knows all about how to do this. Here you go, Mia. Actually, I'm going to show my internet friends, and I'll give this to you. Uh, this is a really nice commentary, the IBP Bible background commentary. This is the one we're using, the New Testament. So go to work and start typing those questions in. Any questions, Jill? You want them? Yes, I do. Here comes our first question, then I'll repeat it for everybody. What is the role of a father? Ooh. What is the role or rule? Role. What is the role of the father? That's an excellent question. Hopefully our research will give us some excellent Martian question. Another one. Mm -hmm. Do kids have importance? Do children have importance in the ancient world? Excellent question. And that might be different between our our, our ancient Jewish people of first century and maybe other cultures. Excellent question. Another one? Okay. Those are great questions. What else, Martian? Anything else? All right. Now I'm going to go to my face-to-face -face audience, and I want you to holler out what you saw just about these three verses, and I'll write them down. Who's got one? Or if you have it back in, in internet land, you can also. Okay, we have another question while we're waiting. Yes. Who normally got the inheritance? Ooh, who normally got the inheritance? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, no one ever asked for one share of the inheritance from the father. Yeah. Good. We have our first bit of research that is very, very important. It is, as in other words, it's a disgrace. Is that what you're saying? Oh, uh, just that it was unheard of. Unheard of. That's even maybe, that's a level worse than disgrace. Yeah, hang on just a minute. Unheard of to ask, well, I can't even, okay, calm it down, Michelle. There we go. Ask dad for inheritance. 
Excellent. So this we we've got some suspense. Go ahead, Alec. Um, it says that the uh, eldest son received a double portion. The firstborn son receives a double portion. I wonder if that's true if the firstborn is a daughter. Does anybody know that one? That's a good Martian question. Yeah, probably not. That would be my assumption. Yeah. So if there's only two sons and the firstborn mathematicians would probably get two thirds. Yep, two thirds. So here the, the oldest son gets two thirds of the inheritance. Great. What else did you discover? Josh. Um, the father would just inherit his son. Yeah, yeah. If you did this, I'm going to put an arrow down here. Father. Normally, a father would disinherit. Does there say anything about beating? Boy, that's that's terrible. But I'm just saying it. Yeah. It does. It does say. Can a son get beaten father by this? Beaten him or worse. Does it say what the worst is, or you're just making it? Are you softening it? No, it just says beaten him or worse. Okay. What's worse than beating? Oh, okay. I'll just say beaten. Disowning is worse. You can look yeah. In Exodus 21, verse 17, or Deuteronomy 21, verses 18 through 21, if you wish for further details. Yeah. <laughs> and I know those verses. There are verses about stoning rebellious kids. Oh. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. That's what worse means. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! All right. Anything else? So, so the firstborn receives the double a double portion. Actually, from my own research, I know this. To ask your father for the inheritance while he's still alive is basically saying this, Dad. I wish you were dead. Wow. And so, a lot of Jewish fathers not only would they not give him the money, but they maybe would have beaten him or worse. Zoom and Facebook friends, anything you'd like to add to that? We'll give you just a second. Anything else? Do you all came up with the same things basically? Good. Anything to add? Okay, we're gonna take the next three verses. Reese, come on up. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, right yeah. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself up to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. Okay. All right. Send me your Martian questions. Comments, maybe even intelligent guesses as to what things really going on culturally, historically, that we need to know. Stuff that's underneath the surface. Face to face, folks, start to research. Michelle, can you repeat what the worst was? Oh, the verse here. The worst. Oh, the worst. The worst, the worst probably means being stoned, um, according to the Old Testament verses. Can you give me those verses again? Exodus 21. Verse 17, and Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21. And actually, if somebody has the time, look up those verses and see if I, my memory is good on stoning. Can you do that, uh, yes. Allie? Yeah. It might take a little bit. It might take a little bit. Okay. So we're working on the next three verses, verses 14 through 16. This is the sun going out to Wichita. Because there's a wild city. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> doing some wild living. Go, folks. Michelle. Yes. When they say something, can you repeat it? Because we can't hear it. Oh, okay. All right. Do we have any Martian questions yet? <coughs> or comments? 
what's so special about pigs? Yeah, what is so special about pigs? What it, it seems like, yeah, there's a special cultural meaning, which I believe is true even today, and not just for our Jewish friends. Uh, you've heard of kosher food, uh, but I would, I, many of my Muslim friends will not touch pork either. Does, does anybody know, either on the internet or here, what, why are pigs in the bad category? They're unclean. And what makes them unclean? Maybe what they eat? What they eat? They play in the mud. They play, yeah. But they're supposedly one of the most intelligent mammals we have. Their hooves. It's their hooves. Yeah. All animals that have those kind of hooves are considered unclean. Excellent. Another, another question? Why couldn't we eat the pig's food? Yeah, and my research is, I think, did you discover that one? No? I can answer that one, but. Well, we have, they're called carob pods. Let's start to write this down, and then you all, with your research, help me. They're raw. They're raw? They're raw, he says, and say the other part. They're fed raw to animals. People roasted and eat them. But subsided, but subsided on them only in time of famine. Ah, people eat these only in famine. Here's a Martian question. Does famine have some kind of spiritual significance? I'm not sure I know, but that's a yes. What have you got? Um, it says here that people often view famines as divine judgments. There you go. Famine. Judgment from God. But back to the pods. I, I'm stuck by this word. Has anybody else ever eaten uh, carob chips instead of chocolate chips? Yeah, they're. I think they're pretty good. But obviously, we're talking about something different here. I think there are two options as to what these pods were. Did anybody in their commentaries find the two options? Okay, good. Maybe I got you the not so good commentaries. What we've got, it either they're either really bad because they're so untasty, they're so bad to eat that, that they actually cause people to repent, that it's just a last resort. You only eat them in famine. Some other scholars would say that they're pods that have lots of stickers, they're hard to get to, and so only pigs eat them because. You have to kind of have a pig snout in, other, in, in order to eat these pods. Either way, we're not, it's not looking very good here, is it? Yeah. All right, a question, Jill. Uh, why did no one feed the sun? Yeah, great question. Why did no one feed the sun? What kind of, yeah, slave master did he have? That he actually wanted to eat the food of the pigs. Does the Bible actually say that he did eat, go ahead and eat the food, or is it just that he wanted to? I think that he, he just, did. yeah, he did. He uh, could, well, he, here it says he would have gladly. He oh. would have gladly, but he didn't quite. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, I think that's an unanswered question. Why in the world didn't they? I mean, it sounds like when he when the sun reflects back to his father hired hand that those slaves were for sure treated better. I'll go back as a slave. We haven't gotten there yet. Good. Other questions? Was it hard to travel between countries? Ooh, was it hard to travel between countries? That's an excellent question. Researchers, did, did anything show up in your commentaries about? It didn't. It did say, oh yes, you got something. Well, it says that they would uh, seek fortune in less economically pressed areas. They would seek fortunes in less economically oppressed areas. I don't know if your commentaries would say that too, but I would imagine that the father didn't have completely, uh, how do I say this, liquidated capital? Just probably like your all's parents wouldn't, would. I mean, some, a lot of his wealth is tied up in land. And so if he's giving his younger son a third of it, I imagine the father had, did he have to sell some of his land? And if the son's going away to a distant country, did he sell that land? Was it a smart thing to do? 
I also imagine he's pretty young. What would indicate that the younger son is maybe your all's age? If he goes off, he probably is. I'm just making some intelligent guesses here. He's probably single. And in the time of Jesus, sometimes people got married as early as 15, 16. So you're maybe talking about a 14 year old doing this or a 16 year old. Isn't that wild to think about? My goodness. There's some other cultural stuff about this part. Maybe, the, maybe we've already said, what's the obvious cultural thing we've got to know? Pigs are unclean. Someone on Facebook <laughs> said, pigs don't sweat. They keep many bacteria on the skin. Ah, ew. Okay, yeah. Ew. Even those cute little ones we see on Facebook, the little pet ones, probably, yeah. My dad used to have pigs and we weren't allowed to play with them. Anything else? Anything? Yes, Allie. Oh, no. Oh. Not, I, if pigs don't sweat, then why do we say I'm sweating like a pig? <laughs> why do we say I'm, did she see me? If pigs don't sweat, why do we say I'm sweating like a pig? There is the Martian question of the year. Yes! Ah, and I am sweating like a pig right now. That is funny, yes. One of the things that I think, Oh, you have a Martian question? Uh, it's a or comment. Some, comment. Yes. Um, that the son is from another country and that could impact how the masters treated him. Just maybe yes. Right that might be the reason why the son wasn't fed is because he is, he's from another country. He's a foreigner. Yeah. And we see that sometimes. Good observation. My assumption is that most Jewish people hearing this for the first time, I want you to try to imagine this because we know the whole, most of you know the whole story. But pretend you're hearing this for the first time from Jesus, and he's just talked about this young son almost starving to death and eating pig food. Everybody in that audience, as Jewish people, are probably expecting the story to be done. And the younger son got what he deserved. He got what he deserved. He disgraced his father. He basically said his father wished he were dead, and then he gets in trouble. Jill, a question or, or comment? Nope. Oh, okay. But I find that fascinating. But the story is not over. I want to make sure we don't have any more comments from the internet or here. We are good to go. All right. Allie, come up and read to us verses 17 through 24. Okay. Where do I look? <laughs> Just right, okay. right there. Mm -hmm. Um. <coughs> But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough bread to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned. I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and, al and is alive again. He is lost and was found, and they began to celebrate. Thank you, Ellie. All right, those of you um, working, seeing this through internet, Please send in your comments and questions. The rest of you go to the commentaries. Again, this is verses 17 through 24. like my hosts are having lots of fun right now <laughs> yes. with comments coming in and out. 
you can almost you can also comment to me, internet friends, if you uh, want to do a tour here pretty soon. Isaac has a comment. Question from Facebook: Eating food from the dirty pig, unworthy. Pigs meant lowest, unclean. He was lowest. He was, yeah, yeah. Very, very well said. I mean, it's one thing to disgrace your father, but 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 to even be around pigs and then to eat what they're eating, he, this is lowest of the low. Yeah, and I and I'm sure even though we're saying this and seeing this in commentaries, I'm not sure the gravity hits us. Try to think about what we would consider to be the lowest of the low today. What would be totally disgusting? And that's that's where we're at. Another comment? Yeah, please. Yeah. What's the deal with the ring? What is the deal with the ring? Yeah, and and it doesn't say signet ring in the Bible. I know it. But that's, did we get anything from the commentaries about the ring? Yes. Um, it would symbolize reinstatement to summonship because it had a family sign on it. Ooh. It has the families like, she's saying that the ring equals a reinstatement into the family Say that last part again because there's a like a family symbol on it. Wow. I know that and this is in an Old Testament story, Genesis 38. Judah gives his ring as payment for a prostitute. That's a whole another thing right there. But anyway, and he kind of, it's so precious it almost functions like a like a like his credit card. It's because he because he wants that ring so badly that she knows that he'll come back with the money. So yeah, reinstatement as a family, that's awesome. Another question. What is a nice robe as compared to a normal robe? I or maybe uh, are clothes more significant in this story setting than in today's? Yeah, are clothes more significant in, in, in this story in the Bible than in today? I, yeah, I don't know, you know, if you have the nicest tennis shoes, I mean, does it, do we do status symbols with our clothes today? I'm looking at my face. I'm seeing heads shake some communities more than others. My people are saying, yeah, it's still true today. I would say that there's a special coded meaning about the best robe. Did you find that in research? What does the best robe mean? It belongs to the Father himself. Yeah. So as opposed to a no normal robe, the best robe belongs to Father. And that's the robe he puts on him. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what is the importance of a fatted calf? Mm. They aren't vegetarian. Oh, oh, oh that's a, uh, okay. That's maybe they are. Now I made it. I made assumptions, didn't I? Good question. I'm going to look to my people in the room. Did. Some, somebody over here, I think we've got fatted calf somewhere. Did you find it? Okay, go for it. Yes. Oh, it says that the calf would be enough to hold, to feed the whole village. So they're going to be throwing a banger pretty much. Woo! <laughs> He's saying this fatted calf is enough <coughs> to feed the whole village. We are throwing a real banger. I'm going to put that down. <laughs> yes. Big party. Feeds entire village. Is is the meat more? Is this kind of like? Is this kind of the whole veal thing? Is is the meat of a fatted calf more tender? And it's and it's more expensive because if you'd wait for the thing to grow, you'd get more out of it. But this is a party, and pretty soon tonight we're going to ask. You all can give your opinions as to whether the young son deserved this. What else? Yes. Um, why did he say his son was dead? Ooh. I'm going to look at it. Did we have that on the commentary? Why is the son dead? It's a good question. And I don't remember reading that in the commentaries. But you have to understand, we are in an age where we didn't have internet, cell phones, a postal service that's reliable. 
for all the father knew he would never see him again. That brings me, yeah, I don't know that, I think this is maybe just Michelle commentary, maybe not, so take it with a grain of salt. If this older man runs to see his son, what does that kind of imply if you play it out in your mind? What was this older man doing day after day after day after day? Waiting. He's waiting. I, I'm because if he weren't waiting and watching, the son could have made it all the way up to the house because dad's working and and he sees him and he runs. I'm going to ask my people here in the room, did you get anything in the commentary about Jewish men of first century running? What did you get? Say it loud. Undignified. It's undignified. Men don't run. It is undignified. Wow. Of course, you remember that they're, the men are in skirts as well as women. You got to pull them up. You show your legs. I don't. It's, it's undignified. And yet the father ran. Any other comments or questions? We have something about the sandals as well. What, is, what do the sandals mean? Was that slaves or impoverished workers often did not wear sandals? Slaves don't have sandals. The father was making sure to the son that his, his plan was not going to be to become a slave. I have a Martian question for my internet people, unless you have one for me. And you all can have this question too. Did the younger son come back because he was repentant or just desperate? Or was he both? I, I think it's obvious from the text that he's desperate. <coughs> but does that automate? What if he weren't really repentant? Should that make a difference? If you want to respond to that, do. Do we have a response? Both. Both. You're saying both. Do you have a reason why? You want to type that in right quick? You're pretty sure it's both? I'll be honest, I kind of think so too. But I was reading it, getting ready for tonight, and I thought, does God sometimes help out people who aren't repentant? I'm spilling the beans here. I, I kind of think the father figure is, is God. Should we ever help people who are just desperate and not necessarily repentant? Or do they need to really be sorry? I don't know. A response? No? Uh, the father's response is the same in either case. I don't know if there's more to that statement. That's all I can read. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's a very good point. The father responds either way. Yeah. So maybe it doesn't matter. That's beautiful. That's, that's really radical love. That is really radical love. From internet or from people in the room? Have, have we got everything? All right. Sam's going to come and read the last part. I just looked at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father killed the fatted calf because he has gotten him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Thank you, Sam. All right, once again, send in your comments and questions. Once again, go to the commentaries.
the story is getting richer all the time, right? All the older brother. Do we have something? What is the significance of the young goat? What is the significance of the young goat? I'm going to look. Anything in the commentaries about a young goat? Yeah, Allie, what you got? Um, a, a small goat had much less meat than a cat. Ah, so you see what the older brothers, you wouldn't even give me, you know, your younger son gets steak and I'm just getting a hamburger. Now I'm doing the whole, I, I crossed back over 2017 yet. Yep. So the young goat, not as much meat. You didn't even give me so much as a young goat. Do you believe that? If that's true, what does that do to the story? Is that true? Is there anything in the story that kind of proves to us that, that the older brother had maybe a bit of an attitude problem? And I want you out here and in internet land, argue with me if you don't agree with me. I could be wrong on this one. When I read it this last time, I was struck by this. The older brother asks the slave what all that noise and music was before he knew his younger brother was home. Now think about that. Because another option, another way the older brother could be was just to say, hey, a party. This is great. It's Friday night. I'm going to celebrate with my father. Maybe he didn't go to the parties. And is maybe that part of the problem? Uh, why, yeah, why wasn't the brother happy like the father? Why wasn't the older brother happy like the father? Yeah. Well, let's make some guesses. I'm going to ask my, my commentary people, is it a money thing? Did, he, did the older brother lose any money from the younger son taking the inheritance? A yes or a no from here. I'm seeing a no. And the commentary say that too. No. The older brother's money is secure. So it, it's not like he's lost money. He still gets two-thirds of the inheritance. So yeah, why isn't he happy? But do you blame? I mean, if you're honest, are some of you having some older brother feelings right now? Did the younger son deserve what he got? No. no. Did the younger son need what he got? Did the older brother love kindness? <coughs> no. The older brother did not love kindness in spades. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to look to my people here in the room. Anything else that the commentaries are saying? And we have two questions, yes. Uh, did the older brother ever come into the party? I think according to the text, we don't, we don't know. And uh, help me out commentaries if I'm making this up, because I think it's in there. I think, look it up. I think when the older brother talked back to his father like that, in a sense, he is disgracing his father as much as the younger brother. I'm seeing some heads nod, yeah, that was there, yeah. So he also disgraces his father because as the oldest, as the firstborn, he is supposed to be the reconciler, and he's not the reconciler between the younger son and father. He, is, he makes the problem worse. And he talks back to his father. I don't know. The, another question. Why didn't the father tell the older son that his brother was back? Yeah. I, I, that's an excellent question. I don't know. Do you have an idea? The person who has. They have the answer. Yeah, they didn't have cell phones. Was was the father testing him? Was it just Jesus's way of making a point? It it just catches me though that the older brother. I mean, it'd be one thing if he knew it was a party for the younger son. He didn't know. He's being kind of 
what's the word, snarky, snarky? He's being snarky about parties and he doesn't even know it's about his younger brother yet. Then it kind of, then it kind of gets doubly snarky. But any other comments from this room? We're gonna try to pull it together. It says that Jesus used the elder brother here in a transparent metaphor for the Pharisees. Yes. I'll repeat what Tim said there. Jesus here is talking about the older brother. He's like the Pharisees. If we do literary context, we know the two stories. The Pharisees were grumbling that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners. Do you see how this kind of relates to the story? That actually is one of my questions. I'm going to ask that question, and we're going to have everybody. Oops. So, how am I doing? The older son equals the Jews, particularly the scribes and the Pharisees, and the younger son equals the Gentiles. Gentiles, if that's a new term for you, are people who are in their bloodline or ethnically are not Jewish. And we do have some Gentiles and also some unclean Jews who are wanting to become followers of Jesus. Why would Jewish people feel this way about Gentile people? With the same kind of disdain that the older brother had for the younger brother. Lesson. They didn't work for it. I heard from Aaron, and that's exactly right. If you think long term history, the Jewish people were like, we've worked for 2,000 years obeying the law of Moses, keeping 613 laws just to, on obeying the Sabbath. We've worked our rear ends off and have been so good and obeyed God so well. And then these people who for the last 2,000 years have worshiped idols and have done all sorts of wild parties and have got to have a kind of a whole bunch of fun. And now they come in as a people group and want to be God's people. Are you kidding me? When did we ever get to have that fun? Can you kind of see how that works? So the story works on two levels. It can work as individuals. Some of you out there maybe think of yourselves as older brothers or younger sons, but it also works with people groups. The Pharisees, when they saw Jesus being kind to prostitutes, and tax collectors, and Gentiles, and healing a Roman centurion son, they were like, those people don't deserve it. Ah. Uh, the Pharisees were having trouble loving kindness, were they not? So here's the big question for you and me. I'll just ask it like this. Which character do you relate to the most? Are you a younger son? Are you an older brother? And we talk about the father being God. Is it okay, though, for you to kind of relate to being God? As in you maybe have shown shalom justice <laughs> i'm going to give a time for our internet people to to respond if they want to and for you all to respond and think about that that's maybe the question of the hour who are you and what is god saying to you today i'll give you some time to think do we have any responses no? The older brother. The older brother. I think I too struggle with being the older brother. So let me take some minutes to wrap it up here. This is a beautiful story that shows Shalom Justice. The father gives the younger son so what he needs, but he totally doesn't deserve it. And we see a negative example of loving kindness. The older brother did not love it when his younger sibling got grace, even though he needed it. And folks, that's my temptation as well. And maybe yours. Who would be the whole people groups today that maybe we think, hey, they don't deserve that. But maybe it's not ours to say who deserves what. And what if we would 
be with Jesus enough to realize, in a sense, we're all sinners, and we're all tax collectors, and we're all prostitutes. To love kindness. I want to give you a little taste of what we're going to do next week. I'm going to do another internet game, and we're going to have it better figured out and so that so that you'll see the screen right on your internet screen. We're going to talk about the story of Jonah. I'm still collecting. I've got some stories, but I need more of your to love kind of stories. And I'm going to give you a challenge. I want you to see if you can come up with two or three or five movies that illustrate the concept of Shalom Justice. Here's a hint. I think one of the new hot movies out right now, Wonder Woman, is one of those movies. Can you next week, to, and you don't even have to like the movie, and maybe there's some things not so good about the movie, but how does the movie talk about Shalom Justice? And do they talk about it and illustrate it in the same way the Bible does? I think that'll make for a juicy conversation. I'm going to give my internet friends one last chance to respond. We're going to do an open-eyed prayer. Lord Jesus, help us to love kindness, just like you. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Thanks so much for all of your questions and comments. God's blessings to you. Send me your stories.